this is the crypto crashes course. Um, and so the idea, what we're, what we're trying to do, this would be maybe a little different than if you've been to other MRU uh, uh, webinars, just trying to give like a basic overview of we're going to focus on uh, Bitcoin. I mean, really like the crypto world is, you know, there's so many facets uh, to it. Um, it's just really hard to, you know, go through every single thing from NFTs to DAOs to DeFi to all these things. So we have an hour. I'm going to do my best to give you like a brief overview of kind of how Bitcoin works and how how we think about Bitcoin. Um, and so that's the goal. At any point, so since this is more, I would say it's a little bit more like a lecture than it is like a usual MRU webinar where there's lots of interaction. But at any point, if you want to, you know, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I'll be able to see the chat. And make sure if you want everyone to see your question that you, you've you uh, set the uh, setting to everyone. Or you can unmute yourself. I think there's, I think this is a small enough group that's fine if you unmute yourself. Um, and so, because usually the way this talk goes, the other times I've given this talk, is it's just there's, there's lots of questions. Um and it, that is where the interactivity is. So if you just, you know, if you have something, just, just go ahead and um, ask. All right. So just to motivate the talk, I prepared a little quiz for you about uh, predictions about the future from the past. All right. So at the top there, you should see uh, the link to join a uh, poll everywhere. I don't know, Lindsay, if you could put it in the chat. And so this is just a quiz. We're going to a few questions here just to see, you know, how well people are at predicting the future. So this is a real quote. Uh, blank won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. And people will soon get tired of staring at a blank every night. So what do we think this was about? Radio, TV, Netflix, personal computer, none of the above. So you should be able to join the poll everywhere at that link above, at the poll ev.com slash Matthew Hill 691. Have some responses. Okay, we have TV, we have personal computer. I'll give you guys a little, little more time. All right, last, last call. Let's see. So it was uh, TV. And so this was a prediction about, a uh, terrible prediction about television. Won't be able to hold on any market it captures after the first six months. People soon get tired of staring at a plywood box. Okay, next one. What the heck? There we go. All right. So a couple of months after the Wright Brothers, a New York Times op-ed contained the following passage. A couple of months before the Wright, Wright Brothers. It might be assumed that the flying machine, which will really fly, might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanics in from blank to blank. No doubt the problem has attractions for those in interest, but to the ordinary man, it would seem as if effort might be employed more profitably. So basically, how long did, they, did the New York Times think that it would take uh to develop a uh, uh a flying machine in 10 to 100 years 100 to a thousand years okay. nobody's saying one to ten nobody's saying a million to ten million oh a, what uh, somebody says a million to ten million Okay, let's go to the next. Let's go see what it says. So it was one million to ten million years was the uh, was the New York Times uh, prediction. So they just a few months before somebody uh, invented um, you know the airplane, they they guessed it would take one million to ten million years. Okay, 
All right, this is uh, the uh, last one, I think. Yeah, there we go. So the quote is, I am sure in that future years, it'll be found that the blank has had a permanent effect on the morals of our age as pretty near any other factor you can mention. Go into our homes, those of luxury and those of poverty, and you'll see the blank has completely supplanted all other that father and mother and brother and sister bow in subjection to the blank. It's not working. There we go. Oops, sorry. You saw the answer. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't see the answer. But just take it. Yes, radio. Okay. Any other guesses? Okay, most people saying the radio. Okay, nobody saying Nintendo. Nobody saying personal computer. All right. It was the teddy bear. So this is this is a real quote from a newspaper, I think around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, this, this, so I, I double check these because you can go find like predictions about the future from the past. A lot of them are uh, apocryphal. So I checked these at all these I actually found. I tracked down the actual like newspaper articles on all these to make sure they were all they were all real. And this one indeed is real. I'm sure that in the future years it will be found that the fuzzy, stupid stuffed animal has the permanent effect on the morals of our age. Um, and then uh, yeah, like I love the last one. The father and mother and brother and sister bow in subjection to the horrid little beast. So dire predictions about what the what what the teddy bear uh would do and so the whole point of the whole point of you know motivating um the the discussion is just to give a bit of a caveat like we're still pretty early in terms of the development of crypto so you know it's been a little over uh 10 years since uh, uh the first white paper since the satoshi's white paper um which is, you know, still, still pretty early. So, you know, take everything with a grain of salt, like in terms of like, we don't really know, you know, how things are going to turn out. And, you know, me, especially as I'm not exactly sure, um, you know, what's going to happen, you know, if, you know, if crypto will be a blip or if, you know, crypto uh, will become, you know, some form of crypto will become some sort of universal currency. Um, we're just, you know, we're kind of pretty early in this. So my goal is to sort of just give you an overview today so that you have, you know, some knowledge level if your students are um, are asking about it. I haven't had as much this year, so you know, I still teach at, at the college level. I haven't had that much questions about crypto this year, probably because the, you know, the um, the price has gone down. But definitely, like last year and through the pandemic, you know, you're constantly fielding uh, uh, crypto questions. So hopefully, you know, the goal is just to give you enough where you can, you know, to to uh, to, to to talk about it. Okay, so how? Let's just see where people are at. Should be able to like click on these, and it'll show you. So how how knowledgeable are you? Just just so I can sort of set see where people are. Sometimes people you know know a lot. Sometimes people don't know anything, and that's okay. Wherever you are, okay. So we have most people on the bottom of the scale, which is fine. Everybody else? Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> most people in the the orange seems to be popular. Nobody in green, huh? Okay, so most people, oop, connection. All right, there we go. All right, so most people, you know, having having a little bit of knowledge, not much. All right, okay, that's good because that's that's sort of where the talk is aimed. Okay, and so throughout this presentation, you know, you're going to get kind of the two points of view where you have, you know, the Bitcoin maximalists or people that are very, very bullish on Bitcoin and crypto um, in general. So you have that camp. And so that's represented over here on the slides in this column. So, you know, this is someone who's very bullish on, on crypto. Fiat is backed by violence. Bitcoin is peaceful revolution backed by math. The choice is simple. And then you have on the other side, people that are very skeptical of crypto and basically think it's just a big Ponzi scheme. It's just a massive scam. And anybody involved is a charlatan or, you know, a moron. And so, you know, I found this tweet. Imagine if keeping your car idling 24-7 produced solved stokus you could trade for heroin. That's this person's answer to what Bitcoin is. 
So you have both these points of views. And so I'm going to try to get, like I said, I'm trying to give you sort of where these groups are, are coming from. And then hopefully you'll have like, again, like a solid knowledge base uh, to jump off from. Okay. So the underlying technology of crypto is the blockchain. So that is like, that's the innovation. Like really, like if you're thinking about, you know, crypto, it's, you know, this underlying blockchain technology, um, that's really um, the new thing, like the new thing that enabled cryptocurrency to exist um, was uh, was blockchain um, technology. And so the way you can think about it is, it's just like a big spreadsheet that just keeps track of who owns what, all right? So this is examples from my personal life. But when I was in college, uh, we used to play poker a lot in the dorms and we would never exchange money. What we would do is we just had a sheet. So at the end of the night, you would cash out. If you're up $20, you just push, put plus 20 on this sheet. If somebody had lost $20, they would put minus 20 on the sheet. Okay. And so it's just this long sheet that have everyone names on. Every time you played poker, it would have like your sort of running account. And then at the and and then the biggest guy in the dorm, the you know the biggest buffest guy, this guy Mike, Mike B, he kept the sheet to make sure it was safe. Nobody was messing with it. So the sheet is like uh, 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 this like sheet which keeps track of the money. That's like the blockchain. It keeps track of who owns what. So you think of each person on on this database has like an entry and what they have. And if two people agree to a transaction you know, they can move money or whatever from one person to the other. And it's kept track of on this sheet. And not only is it kept track of, but basically all the transactions all through history are kept track of. So you can look back in time to see, okay, at this point in time, this person had this much money. Now they have this much money. And then this is all secured by cryptography. So it's all secured by basically, you know, fancy mathematics, combinations of public and private keys that's what keeps it um, secure and it's permissionless, meaning nobody's um, in charge. So it's like, if you think about it, it's a pretty interesting innovation where it's basically a database that secures um, itself. Um, and as long as two people agree to transact, it uh, that transaction can take place. So in my uh, personal analogy, the sheet is like blockchain and the person keeping it safe, my buddy Mike from college, that's like mathematics. That's the cryptography that keeps make sure uh, that it's uh, that it's safe. Okay, hopefully that's clear enough. Any questions though? No questions. Okay, wait. Let me just make sure I have my chat open. Yeah. All right. Use the chat function instead of the Q and A. Let me just make sure I don't have any Q and As. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So the proponents of the, the proponents of the blockchain would be like, look, this is a you know this is a revolutionary uh, technology, and so you know with fiat money, with the money you and I you know you and I use every day, like basically that is kept track of the digital part of it is kept track of with uh, with with banks. Okay, so the proponents of the blockchain with technology, like, look, this this is a pretty cool technology, and it is, you know, a pretty cool technology. And again, it's like enabled by this, like, you know, new form of mathematics. The detractors would point out that it's fairly slow, in that, um, you know, it actually takes a long time for a transaction to clear on uh, on the blockchain. And so, you know, roughly the Bitcoin blockchain, the blockchain underlying Bitcoin that keeps track of all the Bitcoins, um, it takes, uh, it can process 4.6 transactions per second, where Visa can process 1700. So, you know, the one, the type of money that we're all used to using is much faster at processing these, these transactions um, than, uh, than Bitcoin. And so that's a downside. Now, the proponents would say, look, there are different, you know, there are basically different solutions. You can sort of settle on some other layer and then put another blockchain later. And that's basically the Lightning Network. 
And then the proponents would be like, all right, so you need some other technology to, to, uh, to run this? Doesn't seem that revolutionized. Now, that's nice thing about uh, the blockchain is it's decentralized. So there's nobody in charge of, uh, of the blockchain. It's basically anybody can access it. So you can go look at the Bitcoin blockchain. You can like download it and see, all right, you know, where the Bitcoins are, what, ad what addresses they are associated with. So if you own Bitcoin, you basically you have a you have a wallet. That wallet has an address, and then it has Bitcoins associated with that address. And so people say that's nice because there's nobody in control, essentially. And the proponents or the detractors would say, okay, well, it's kind of nice to have people all uh, in charge. So you know who to hold accountable if something bad happens, right? So like yesterday, you know, yesterday I thought I lost my credit card. It turns out it was just behind my driver's license, which is not where it usually is. But, you know, I was panicking. I was like, where's my credit card? I can't remember. I don't know when, when I lost it, you know? And I, But it, it wasn't that worrying because I was like, all right, well, I could call Amex and like, you know, if anything has happened, you know, if anything has, you know, if anybody has bought anything suspicious outside of, you know, my usual morning coffee, um, then I can, you know, I, I can have somebody to, you know, to, to complain to and make sure that the payments are uh, revoked. But the Bitcoin maximalists, the Bitcoin proponents would say, well, you know, the Bit Bitcoin is unhackable. So what do I have to worry about? I got my money. It's in my wallet. Nobody's ever hacked the Bitcoin blockchain. And so what's the problem? There's never going to be a problem where I need to, you know, complain to somebody because it is secure. However, other blockchains have been hacked. And, you know, if you lose your passcode, if you lose basically the password to your wallet, then your money's gone forever. There's nobody to re recover the password from. And the, and the Bitcoin proponent was like, oh, I won't lose my passcode. That's not going to happen. Okay. All right. But of course, that has happened. So here's a, here's a fun uh, example. Okay. 250 million. Wow. All right. Okay. So let's give you, so now hopefully you have some uh, grasp of uh, blockchain, the blockchain technology basically just a database that keeps track of who owns what. And so Bitcoin itself was um, basically proposed, invented in 2009 by Satoshi uh, Nakamoto. Um, that is a pseudonym. So that's not the person's real name. And the idea was we're going to have a fixed amount of these Bitcoins. So nobody can just create new Bitcoins. Like with a dollar, the Federal Reserve can create new dollars um, whenever they would like. So the Federal Reserve can push a button and print uh, print um, digital dollars, basically. Or the Treasury can print you know, uh, physical dollars. Um, so Bitcoin is not like that. Basically, the way new Bitcoins are made is there are miners that sort of help verify the transactions. So when one person sends a Bitcoin to another person, that is verified by miners, and then they receive some Bitcoin as a reward. Slightly more complicated than that, but that's just like as simple um, as we can make it. So that's how new Bitcoins are made, but there's a fixed amount of Bitcoins. And so as, um, as time goes on, eventually we'll all the Bitcoins will be released. So I think the estimate is like some somewhere in the 2100s. Um, that's when they'll all the Bitcoins will be released. And I think there's 21 million Bitcoins. Um, somewhere, you know, somewhere around around that much. Okay. So there's a fixed amount of these Bitcoins. The system is basically self-regulating in that people are incentivized to verify the transactions because they get paid um in Bitcoins. Um and there's no central um, authority. And so, you know, what was Satoshi Nakamoto's motivation? Like, why create this new um, currency? And Satoshi, we sort of know Satoshi's motivations because, so you look through most of human history. If you if you go through most of human history, um, 
you know, money is hard. I mean, and money's hard to get. You know, indigenous people use rare shell shells. You know, many societies use rare metal, metal that's hard to get. So you couldn't just easily create the money. After we moved to fiat currency, so after you know the government is in charge of the currency, then money is soft, i.e., easy to produce. Um, the government can just create currency um, when it would like. And Satoshi wanted re to return to uh, hard currency. So in the chat, uh, Amir is asking how to buy a Bitcoin. So there are a couple different places you could buy Bitcoins. Um, so there's like a lot of um, uh, uh, online brokerages like Coinbase where you can go and buy Bitcoins. Now, it's important to note when you buy a Bitcoin from like Coinbase, they own the Bitcoin. So they keep it in their their centralized wallet. And um, basically, you just have a claim on their Bitcoin. So that if you buy Bitcoin, like say via Coinbase, it sort of has this advantage where, yes, if you lose your password, they'll they'll you know, they can you can get back in. If something if your account gets hacked, you can complain to Coinbase, that sort of stuff. Bitcoin is kind of like a barter system, correct? No, not necessarily. So a barter system would be one where, you know, one where I say, okay, I'll trade you this pen for an apple. And we, you know, argue back and forth. Okay, and maybe I'll, I'll throw in this, these, you know, these, these AirPods for, for the apple as well, where you're bartering back and forth. Bitcoin is theoretically, the idea of Bitcoin would be, it's just like, it's just like dollars. It's just people buy and sell things in Bitcoin instead of dollars. So you just, you could think of it like Satoshi wanted to replace the dollar as like, hey, instead of using dollars, let's use Bitcoin. Because it has this, in his in his or her mind, like it has this advantage where nobody's going to come along and then just create a bunch more Bitcoins. You know, whereas with the dollar, you know, if, or this is not as well, recently, obviously we've had inflation troubles, but not to the extent of many uh, developing countries where, you know, the government will come along, print a bunch of dollars, print up print British currency up and all of a sudden it's worthless. If you read about Argentina or Venezuela or Zimbabwe, you know, this sort of thing happens. Okay. So essentially, so how do we know this? So this is sort of like what's, what's, uh, so what's sort of, to me, when I like, you know, when you see crypto out there, when people are talking about it, um, the most interesting part of crypto to me was like the invention of Bitcoin because it's a full sci-fi story. It's like something out of a sci-fi novel, except it's like real. And so, all right. So Satoshi puts in the Genesis block, which again, just sounds like sci-fi, the Genesis block. So he puts in the initial like programming of the blockchain, he puts in there this note. So he puts in there this, this little reference, the times, Chancellor on the brink of second bailout for banks. Okay. So this inclusion, this little secret message that was put in uh, in the blockchain basically suggests that, and we don't know, I mean, we don't know the exact motivations because nobody knows who this Satoshi Nakamoto is, um, but it suggests he didn't like this current fiat system where central banks could basically print money and bail out big banks. So if you think about the 2008, 2008, 2008 financial crisis, you know, the banks got bailed out by the government. Where did the government get the money to bail out the banks? They just created it. Okay. And so Satoshi wants to create this alternative financial system that, you know, nobody is in, uh, in charge of. And what is crazy? So, okay. So, so that's what I'm saying. It's a sci-fi story. Satoshi, he's like, or she, she's, she's like, all right, you know, I don't like the system, you know, where the government can just create money. So I'm going to make my own system. It's going to be based on the blockchain uh, technology. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to build it. And, um, oh, by the way, I'm going to be, I'm never going to reveal who I am. No one's ever going to know. And I'm going to have a ton of Bitcoins. So when he or she creates uh, Bitcoin, they have their wallet. And their wallet has bitcoins in it. Okay. Those bitcoins, Satoshi's bitcoins, are worth billions of dollars, but they have never been used. So again, this is never I, I never hear the story. So this person creates a whole new currency that makes them fabulously wealthy, and they never touch the money. And so proponents of Bitcoin will be like, look, this proves that Satoshi was this altruist who basically gifted this system to the world and didn't want to personally gain from it. And then skeptics suggest, well, you know, maybe he died 
and uh, uh, lost uh, uh, their path code. So it's a very interesting story, at least to me. Like, it's like, again, something I, when I was reading about this, when I was first learning about this, I was, this is like totally sci-fi. Uh, like, I can't even believe this actually happened. I can't even believe the Bitcoins are, have never been touched. There are certain people who, you know, there's guesses about who Satoshi might be, but to this day, nobody uh, touched the money. So he's not, I mean, that's the, so in the chat, how is Satoshi wealthy if he's never exchanging his Bitcoins? He's, we don't know. We don't know. He's, he could be wealthy, like if he, if he cashed out his Bitcoins used them to buy something or sold them for dollars but he hasn't they've never been moved they've never been they've never been touched and nobody else has access to them nobody else can can use them either so this person satoshi is just either you know not touching them not using them and exercising incredible self-restraint or they're dead or they lost their passcode or what's even crazier one of the <laughs> I tell you this total sci-fi story. One of the potential people that might be Satoshi uh, it died, but had himself cryogenically frozen. So he could be dead, cryogenically frozen, uh, lost their passcode, or is is alive and is just not not using them. Okay. So, um, all right. So to back up, we have we have the blockchain technology that enables oh so you can see so so zhang 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 mao is asking how do we know that satoshi's wallet is full of bitcoins so with the blockchain technology you can see um so you can see everybody's wallet so everyone has their wallet or their address um and then you can see how many bitcoins are in that wallet so we can see on the blockchain, anybody can see there's Satoshi's wallet and it has lots of Bitcoins in it. I forget how many Bitcoins it has, but it has lots of Bitcoins in it. And since the blockchain keeps track of all the transactions that have occurred, we can see that these Bitcoins were there from the start and they've never been moved. Yes, so Michelle is saying like, uh, it's insane you could lose all your wealth by sim simply forgetting a passcode. No, look, <laughs> I know. I know. That's why you need some sort of like if you actually have lots of crypto, you need, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, a backup system. So so like, you know, full disclosure, like, you know, I have I have maybe like a hundred dollars of Ethereum. So I'm not like a big like, hey, you know, I have lots of crypto. So I have like a hundred dollars of, of Ethereum um, and my passcode is just written on a piece of paper. Um, in a hollowed out book in my house. So that's where I keep mine. If my house burned down, like I'd lose, I'd lose that, uh, I'd lose that a hundred dollars. Um, okay. Any other questions? I know, I know this whole thing is wild. Um, you know, that's what I said. It's sort of, sort of going to be uh, a little different than a normal MRU uh, webinar. Um, so, all right, so we have the blockchain technology that has enabled this digital currency, uh, Bitcoin. Now, the purpose of Bitcoin, or at least, you know, we think what we can guess um, Satoshi's purpose was, was to become a full-fledged currency, like actually replace um, the, uh, you know, replace the, replace the dollar. We have a student who couldn't find his phone, but after seven years, he lost his passcode today. He's gone full in. I wish him well. Oh, so Kathleen is asking, so when you mine and get a Bitcoin, the Bitcoin is just created. Yes. But there's a fixed number of Bitcoins that can be created. So Satoshi set it up. So there's a fixed amount. So we all know what the number is. I think it's 21 million. Um, so we know forever, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoins. And basically the way Satoshi set it up is the miners are rewarded with less and less Bitcoin as time uh, goes on, presumably as the as the uh, uh, the price of Bitcoin rises. All right, so we have a database, the blockchain, that keeps track of how much Bitcoin each person has. And the idea is theoretically, this could replace money. Okay. I want to buy something from you. I transfer Bitcoin from my wallet to your wallet. We come to an agreement. I say, okay, here's the Bitcoin. You give me, you know, the item. 
buy, you can buy things online. You can send money to people. Um, you can send Bitcoin to people around the world. So the idea would be that Bitcoin could theoretically replace currency. At least that's the idea behind it. And so let's assess where Bitcoin is on the three functions of money. So we're all econ teachers here. Does anybody, can anybody maybe put in the chat the three functions of money? Anybody, do we remember the, the three functions of money? I guess you weren't, probably weren't expecting a pop quiz here on a, on a Wednesday afternoon, but do we have a, do we have anybody who's maybe teaching? Unit of account, media of exchange, store of value. Perfect. There we go. Okay. So these are our three functions of money. And so if oh, lots of people, yeah, lots of people getting it. Great. Okay. So if Bitcoin is to be a currency, yeah, so you can trade. Yeah, you can trade. So Michelle's asking if you, do you have to trade Bitcoins in full or can you trade like a half? Yeah, you can trade like, oh, I, I forget what the current, like the current price of Bitcoin is. Let's look it up. So 20,000, 20,700, uh, 20, 20, um, so yeah, you can, you can trade like a millionth of like, uh, of, of, of a Bitcoin. Cause I mean, if, if you had to buy things with one Bitcoin, you can only buy things that are like in increments of $20,000. Um, all right. So let us assess, um, how Bitcoin is doing in terms of fulfilling these functions of money. Medium of exchange, all right. So is it widely used as a medium of exchange? Basically, are people buying stuff with Bitcoin? The answer is sometimes, but not really. So El Salvador really tried to make a push to use Bitcoin as like, they made it legal tender, so you could use it. They, they basically made the entire population download Bitcoin wallets. Um, but in general, even though they, they really had this push, like, Hey, everyone use Bitcoin less than 20% of the population use it regularly. So it did not, even when the government was pushing it, it was not better than the existing currency, at least as a medium of exchange. We know that because people aren't using it. And so the problem with Bitcoin is its volatility. So, you know, it varies wildly in price. And so that makes purchasing things difficult. You know, basically the price of the good is going to vary wildly um, day to day. Um, and in general, it's still pretty cumbersome to use. So it's still pretty cumbersome to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to send, um, to, you know, to send Bitcoin to somebody. It takes a while, um, as I said, and it's not really worth it for small uh, amounts. Okay. Now the proponents of Bitcoin would be like, all right, you know, it it's not really used yet, but we do see it being kind of used in countries with currency issues. So it is used or it was used widely in Venezuela when they had their inflation problem. Um, I mean, I just listened to a podcast last week about Argentina and Argentina has its own currency issues and crypto is used widely um, there. Um, in that, like people use Bitcoin instead of the government currency because the Bitcoin is more likely to hold its value. So the proponents of Bitcoin would say, hey, you know, it's, you know, not yet. It, it, it's not really being used as a medium of exchange yet, but, you know, give it some time. And it is being used in countries with, with currency issues. Okay, unit of account. So unit of account are things basically measured in um, Bitcoin. So, you know, if you look at the the vast amount of goods and services, they're almost all measured still in dollars. So Bitcoin has not achieved its dream of replacing the dollar. Um, most things are measured in dollars. However, we do see some spaces where things are denominated in uh, crypto. And so NFTs, these like digital art things that your students may be into, those uh, those are the price of those are listed in Ethereum, which is a different uh, cryptocurrency, a di different cryptocurrency. However, as I point out on the slides, if when we looked up how much Bitcoin is, 
the value of Bitcoin and Ethereum are measured in dollars. So like the, the unit of account for Bitcoin is in dollars. And oftentimes when you're going to buy something with Bitcoin, you translate it into dollars. So on the unit of, of account front, front it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not doing well against the dollar um, as well. Store of value. So, you know, the case against fiat currency, the case against, you know, just regular dollars um, is inflation. So, you know, even in the U.S., which has relatively low inflation, you know, our currency, like if you put away $100 in 1975 and just kept that $100, it would have lost 80% of its value. So even in a country like the U.S. with fairly, you know, stable prices until like the past two years, um, you know, uh, inflation slowly er erodes the value of your money. Of course, Bitcoin lost 40% of its value in six months in 2022. So it's maybe not the greatest store of value um, either. Although, you know, basically for the back half of this year, it's held pretty steady it's, uh, around $20,000. Um, but it's pretty volatile as well. Like you wouldn't, you know, I don't think most people would recommend, well, maybe some people would. I mean, the Bitcoin max maximalist would be put all your money in Bitcoin. But I mean, most people wouldn't recommend, uh, you know, putting all your money into Bitcoin as a store of value. Although, as I mentioned, when compared to, say, like the Argentinian peso or the Argentinian dollar, like it, it's probably a better store of value than a country whose currency, you know, has been known to suffer from high, uh, high inflation. Okay. Now, the Bitcoin maximalists will say, look, you know, government's going to print money. You know, ultimately, every country, if you look at the history of paper money, paper money always gets devalued and always, you know, at some point. Um, is, you know, just stops being used because it gets devalued. So yes, the US, um, the US has had fiat currency essentially since the Great Depression. And it hasn't been that bad. Like we've, we've had a few bouts of inflation. Um, but the Bitcoin maximalist would say, just a matter of time before uh, it goes to it goes to zero. The Bitcoin critics would be like, look, you know, you have to live I know they would say like, look, you Bitcoin, you know, uh, 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 whatever utopians, like, I know you want to live with no government, but, you know, you have to have a government and the government is going to accept taxes in their currency. Um, you know, part of the advantage of being a government is you get to print the money, you control the money supply and they are going to require their taxes being paid in whatever their currency is. Um, and so, you know, the dollar is not going to go away. As long as the U.S. government's around, the dollar is not going to go away. Um, and Bitcoin fundamentally, you know, has no real use is what the what the critics would say. It's, it's more cumbersome than the dollar. Um, and ultimately, um, it has no real use cases. Okay. And so, you know, trying to play the referee here, I would say, you know, Bitcoin certainly is not as good as the dollar on the functions of money. Medium of exchange, store of value, unit of account, the dollar that you know wins the day. It's incredibly easy to buy things with dollars. You know, you, these days you just like, you know, put your phone up to the to the cash register and you buy something. And so it's the dollar is a fantastic medium of exchange. You know, it has had recent inflation issues. Um but, you know, Bitcoin's value has 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 gone up and down wildly. So if you're thinking about the functions of money, you're comparing the dollar to Bitcoin. The dollar seems uh, seems uh, superior, at least at this point in time. There is a future where you know Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency is more easy to use, it's widely used, and perhaps it uh, it replaces the dollar. All right, let's let's pause. Let's pause a bit for questions, just to see if anybody has it, because I feel like I've been talking forever. Yes. So Alice is saying some countries don't allow Bitcoin trading because it will affect its economy. Yeah. So you, essentially, you, one of, like I said, one of the advantages of being a government is you get to print the money. Um, and um, uh, this is called seniorage, like the like the technical term for it. And so, yeah, many countries don't want people to use Bitcoin. Um, and also, theoretically, Bitcoin, if nobody knows, like like I said, in the in the blockchain, the Bitcoins are associated with a wallet. So we can always see where, like the wallet that is associated with Bitcoin. But if nobody knows 
your wallet's address or nobody knows who's associated with a wallet, it can be anonymous. So we can always tell where the Bitcoins are and what wallet they're associated with, but we don't necessarily know who's associated with which wallet. So sometimes governments don't like that as well because, you know, theoretically, you know, you can have these transactions that are anonymous. Although, you know, if I'm being the Bitcoin maximalist, like <laughs> there's no more anonymous transaction than just paying for something with cash, you know, like then. All right. So cryptocurrency compared to the gold standard. So the gold standard, I'm guessing, uh, Stephen, when you're, when you're, I mean, the weakness of the gold standard is when, when countries basically peg their money to a certain amount of gold, and then basically that peg may, may get out of whack. Um, so, I mean, like Bitcoin, I would say is similar to the gold standard is in that you could think of when we're on the gold standard or when we're using gold, there's a fixed amount of gold. And with Bitcoin, there's a fixed amount of Bitcoins. Um, this is sort of going down a bit of a tangent, but the issue with the gold standard and Bitcoin has the same issue is so there's a fixed amount of gold in the world. And but economies are always growing in terms of what they can produce. So if you're on the gold standard, it's inherently deflationary. OK, what that means is prices have to go down in the long run if you're on the gold standard. So you have a fixed amount of gold chasing more and more goods. So it's basically the opposite of inflation, where you have more and more money chasing fewer goods. So with the gold standard or Bitcoin, they're both inherently deflationary, meaning you have a fixed amount of money and the amount of goods is going up and up and up. And so that means prices will go down. And if you have prices going down, that creates its own set of issues. So with Bitcoin or the gold standard, you're going to get deflation, consistent deflation. And that in some ways is not as bad as inflation, but it does create some issues. So if you look at like US history, like the 1870s were a real rough time in US history, basically because of deflation. And if you look at the Great Depression, there's also deflation in the Great Depression that created its own set of problems. So Bitcoin is similar to the gold standard in that there's a fixed amount and those bring their own sets of uh, troubles. Okay, all right. We're all, we're all probably cryptoed out, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> So the interesting thing to think about, and this is how, you know, this is sort of how I was thinking about cryptocurrency sort of, you know, a couple of years ago is saying like, all right, so inflation is a risk. So obviously we're living for, through inflation right now, whatever it's clocking in at 9% or something, you know? So, you know, I'm sure as, as econ teachers, we all know what's bad about that. Essentially my wages I have my uh, annual review meeting actually tomorrow. So I'm going to bring up uh, the fact that the wages better go up by 9% to match inflation because otherwise you're getting a pay cut. So, you know, because if all the prices are going up by, let's make it 10% to make it easy. You know, if your wages don't go up by 10%, you're taking a pay cut. And your money, if you're not spending your money or it's not growing by 10%, like your savings, you are you know, you're basically losing 10% each year as, you know, as prices go up and up. So if you're concerned about inflation, like, okay, maybe I can get crypto as a hedge. I'll buy the crypto. And so if the dollar, you know, continues to be worth less and less and less, you know, the crypto will be um, a good, a good hedge. The problem with that is that's not really what we've seen in history is that Bitcoin doesn't look like a hedge against in inflation. So, okay, what that means is basically when inflation is low, when the dollar is like strong, the price of Bitcoin is high. So Bitcoin looks like it's worth a lot. When we get inflation, when the dollar becomes worth less, guess what? Bitcoin crashes in price. So, you know, as we got inflation, you know, this year into last year, Bitcoin's price crashed by more than the dollar. So it doesn't really look like people are using it as a hedge against inflation. What it looks like is a tech stock. Basically, when the, when money's easy, when inflation is low, 
and people will put their money into Bitcoin, like they would put it into other speculative stocks like tech stocks. And so if you're thinking of Bitcoin as a tech stock, which its price, it looks similar to a tech stock, goes up when tech stocks go up, goes down when tech stocks go down. It's kind of a bad tech stock because um, what it's built on is a 2008 blockchain. And there's been new innovations in the blockchain technology. And the whole point of Bitcoin is that it doesn't change. The whole idea of Bitcoin is it's safe. It's hard money. So if you're looking, thinking about it as a tech, it's kind of old tech. And so like these newer cryptocurrencies have these like, you know, more features, easily adjustable. Um, so it's not it's not really behaving like in uh, an inflation uh, hedge. Okay. So you know, the final word is, you know, I'll give, again, I'll give, I'll give, uh, I'll give both sides. Um, it's like, look, it's new technology. It's volatile. We've already seen the use case. We've seen people use it in Argentina. We've seen people use it in Venezuela when they can't trust their currency. And like, if you think about it as an inflation hedge, well, we just haven't really, we live in a stable country, even with 10% inflation, like historically, their country's way worse inflation. Um, and ultimately, you know, the Bitcoin maximalists, they think fiat money has a problem. Centralized currency has a problem is that the government controls it. They can print it, do whatever they want with it. Um, and ultimately, they shouldn't have that power. And so Bitcoin, you know, would make it a decentralized technology where no one would have the power to print money. The Bitcoin detractors would say, like, look, if you live in a stable country that has a well-run central bank, and so the Federal Reserve, say what you will about the Federal Reserve, it's staffed by competent economists. Um, you know, if you have a stable country that's well run, like you don't really need uh, Bitcoin and the dollar currently as it existing is a nice piece of technology. And we're not going to get into the environmental concerns in this uh, in this lecture because that would take, you know, another 30 minutes. Okay. Now, we should mention there are sort of other you know, other, other ways to think about um, crypto. So one way to think about uh, Bitcoin, sorry, the other, other way to think about Bitcoin is like, it's digital gold. It's just like gold before the digital era. Like you're not going to use it as a currency. You're just going to use it as a store of value. You're just going to use it. You're going to put your, put your savings in Bitcoin. It'll generally go up in price. It'll be safe. I know it won't go away. That's one you, view of it. People who are a little bit more skeptical of Bitcoin would say and say like, look, it has this like antiquated blockchain, like his blockchain by now is, is old technology, but it brings people into the crypto space. So maybe you can be, so there, there are a bunch of people who are pro crypto. They like crypto, other cryptocurrencies, but don't like Bitcoin. And so I say, okay, the value of Bitcoin is it brings people in to the crypto space where the real stuff is happening. My boss's boss, Tyler Cowen has posited that you know, maybe people just like buying Bitcoin because it goes up and down in price and, you know, people uh, like to take risks. And so they're just attracted to the wild swings in uh, in in cryptocurrency. OK, beyond Bitcoin, we should just mention briefly, there are many other cryptocurrencies that we didn't touch on today. Each cryptocurrency has its own blockchain. Ethereum is the other big one is like the second biggest cryptocurrency. And that blockchain is very adaptable. Um, we know who the creator is, Vitalik Buterin. He does make changes. They just made a big change to Ethereum recently. Um, so that one, you, if you want to think about it, is more like an ever-evolving technology. NFTs are basically digital art whose ownership is tracked on the blockchain. So basically it's taking something like a JPEG, but assigning ownership to it. This has a nice advantage that uh, uh, whoever created the original NFT can get royalties on subsequent sales. And then we'll not get into this, but there's these things called DAOs, which are like organizations on the blockchain, which are, you could think of them like corporations that exist on, well, not about corporations, like nonprofits or whatever groups that exist on, uh, on, on the blockchain. Okay. All right. That's everything. Or that's a, that's a, uh, like I said, it, you get a lot of, a lot of information a lot of stuff in uh, in an hour. What are the main countries that are using? Oh, sorry, I have a bunch of questions here. Okay, hold on a second. 
It's not friendly to people who have no access to digital te technology or just unwilling to get it, such as elderly people like my mom and dad. So yeah, there is a bit of a learning curve with uh, with crypto. Um, so yes, like people who aren't familiar with it, you know, it takes a little bit of takes a little bit of work, and then there's basically levels that you can get involved. Like it's very easy to go to Coinbase and just buy some cryptocurrency. That is very accessible. It's a little more difficult to get your own wallet and then move the money onto your own wallet. That takes a little bit of work. It's actually, yeah, kind of a hassle. I will say though, in many developing countries, um, they it is it is used. And so, you know, um, you know, in many countries, like we think that digital access is limited, but in many countries, the, most people have phones, even in poor countries, most people have phones. Those phones can have a wallet with cryptocurrency on it. Um, can you mix cryptocurrencies in the same wallet? Yes. So uh, yeah, you can't mix cryptocurrencies in the same wallet. What are the main countries that are using crypto? So I haven't seen the distribution around the world, but like I said, I know Venezuela, when their currency collapsed, it was used. And I recently was listening to a podcast and Argentina has something, something, uh, something similar. And I think it's pretty widespread. And it's, I think it's widespread throughout, throughout the world. I mean, you know, so I'm an, I mean, I'm an economist. I'm also an economics teacher. So people talk to me about econ all the time. And so I will say crypto is very interesting because people will ask me about crypto from very different backgrounds. So, you know, you'll have like a 50 year old Uber driver, you know, you'll have like a teenager, you know, all different races, different genders. So it's like, it does seem, you know, pretty, you know, uh, uh, I don't, I, it's hard for me to pin down the demographics. Is there a value in urging diversification, especially if you're using crypto as an investment? I don't know. This I can't give investment. <laughs> Whatever disclaimer, this is not investment device. I should have given that up top. This is not investment device I, I, or investment advice. Like I said, I'm trying to give you sort of both sides, the, the bull and the bear case for crypto. So I know a lot, like a lot of big hedge funds or a lot of big uh, like retirement accounts are thinking about, you know, having small percentage allocated to crypto, you know, as a diversi diversification. Um, do you see a future of government issued fiat monetary systems converting to a blockchain model? Okay, Curtis, this is like a, this is a big, oh, so this is a big question. Like, okay, um, should basically, the U.S. government build its own cryptocurrency. My answer would be why. So, like, I just don't understand what the advantage is of having, like, you know, you're the U.S. government, like, you're the dollars are tracked. Like, I don't understand what, like, you're you're the centralized authority. Why would you want a decentralized system? So it won't be decentralized. I mean, you still would be in charge of it. So you still would create the dollars. They would just be tracked on the blockchain. And like I said, the blockchain technology is kind of cumbersome. So it's just easier to track things in a secure spreadsheet, you know, secured in the usual, usual fashion. So I don't understand. I know, I know the Fed is like looking into like a digital cryptocurrency or dollar cryptocurrency. I just don't get like what the, you know, what, what you get. Like, Cause the big get with cryptocurrencies is decentralized. But if you're the U.S. government, you don't want to be decentralized. You get to print the dollars. So I don't understand why they would do it. So the impact, uh, okay, so Zhang Miao, what it, what might be the impact on monetary policy if crypto is used as currency? If monetary policy would be much less effective. If everyone is using cryptocurrency instead of dollars, um, then, you're, then you're very limited in your monetary policy, what you can do, because basically people aren't using your currency. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see. What will what will we send you? Um, so we'll send you the certificate for attending. I'll send you these slides. Um, we we did record this, so we can also put the recording up at, at like an unlisted YouTube link. So we can send you that as well if you'd like. I know a couple of people will ask for that. Um, like I said, I know it's a lot of information. There's so much. And so we're, I just did my best in an hour time. I appreciate your time coming and being cur courteous because um, sometimes the crypto space can be very not courteous, very rude. Um, so yeah, I appreciate you coming. I appreciate you suffering through just me talking rather than you know a more interactive experiment experience. I'll hang on. I'll be here if you have more questions, but you know that is our time, but I'll hang out. So she was asking me for my info, my resources. I don't just, I can't remember. Like I just Google, Google, I was Googling around, watching videos. I'll see if I have, I'll see if I have my original doc when I was like sort of putting all this together, which was, 
I can send you my blog. I wrote a I like wrote a long blog post about all this stuff. So I'll I'll look through there. I can send that to you, Sheila, if you're interested. Um, yeah. And then I just have some friends that are like way into crypto, and then I'll just like ask them, "Hey, is this true?" So, like our uh, uh, at MRU, we have we, one of our uh, one of our pr- people on staff is super into crypto. So I'd always ask him. I say, "Hey, Brandon, is this right?" Is it true that one of the people who Satoshi might be cryogenically froze themselves? Is that right, Brandon? He'd be like, yes, that did happen. Michelle, we are developing some crypto stuff. So we don't have um, we don't have any crypto specific things yet, but we will shortly, hopefully. Yeah, so at some point, hopefully, we'll develop something about NFTs um, as well, because I do think, you know, there's a lot of interesting things um, happening with NFTs. You know, I think I think a lot of the issue is with, you know, in this space, particularly, you get like the people that are gung ho, like evangelists, and then the people that hate it. And it's, so it's like, you know, with NFTs, you'll get people saying, oh, it's just a JPEG that you click on, you know, and other people are like, it's going to change everything, like every, the whole artistic you know, movement will be revolutionized, you know? And one of those views may be true or may, you know, I, you know, maybe somewhere in between. So I think with NFTs and with crypto, it's hard to get just like basically what's going on here. So I do think we would at some point would like to develop something about NFTs just to be like, all right, how does it work? What are the advantages? Um, those sorts of things. But um, if your dad's an artist, I, I'd say it's really cheap to make an NFT. So he should, uh, he should, he should, uh, you know, Put some NFTs together. No, Robert, you don't need to have a comment for PD credit. We'll send everybody who is here PD credit. Okay. I end the webinar. You'll be hearing from me shortly via email. All right. I'll see y'all. If you'd like to attend a future event, visit our teacher trainings page linked in the description. If you're looking for in-class teaching resources, try our free inflation unit plan, which includes an optional day on crypto. Or you could check out a playlist of our videos aligned to CEE economic standards.